Wall Street. It's fueled some of the greatest economic expansions ever known. It's plunged millions into poverty and ruin. Now the thrill, the terror, the technique, and the technology are the stock exchange on Modern Marvels. Every business day, more than a billion shares change hands on America's major stock exchanges. <laughs> Nearly $90 million worth of stock changes hands every minute. Brokers constantly scramble to do their clients' bidding in the battlefield of high finance. The floor is a rather unique kind of place. It, uh, it's a place where people have known each other many years. Each day, get together to compete on behalf of clients they've never met. A stock exchange is actually two markets in one. First, it's a place where a new company can raise millions or billions of dollars overnight by offering ownership of the business to hundreds of thousands of small investors. These pieces of ownership are called shares of stock. Second, the exchange is the place where people can sell their stock to someone else whenever they wish. You could be in the airline business today, and you could be out of that, and you could be in the automobile business tomorrow. And that ability to enter and exit and get paid back for your investment in those shares creates a great market for the initial investment. People are more willing to put that money up if they know that sometime in the future they'll be able to sell out their interest and go on to the next best thing. 40% of American families own stock in U.S. companies either directly or through mutual funds and pension plans. The exchange lets people know how these companies are doing by allowing a free market to place a value on their stock. Well, I like to say that a stock market is a, a market in information. I mean, it uses information from outside to evaluate companies, but then the process of the stock market creates new information by putting a price on things that everybody in the country can read. The modern market is a tightly regulated and finely tuned institution. But this wasn't always the case. Centuries ago, investing in stocks was chaos. The roots of investment trace back to ancient Greece. Ship captains offered part of their profits to those who'd share the risk of financing a trading voyage. These were all or nothing gambles. A ship might return with riches or might never return at all. The Romans sold stock as well for huge construction projects that were beyond the means of a single businessman. Stockholders made tidy profits by investing in companies that built roads and aqueducts for the government. Investing took a big step in the 1600s in Holland, home of the Dutch East India Company. Like the Greek seafarers before them, the Dutch needed capital for international trade. But this investment was different. People bought a stake in the company, not in a single voyage. This led to wild speculation because investors could sell their shares to one another over time. The price could rise or fall on the vaguest of rumors, spreading panic in the world's first stock exchange. The people who lost the money were the nobles, the merchants, uh, a class of people who, uh, in effect, were the money people of the time who can afford to speculate. It didn't affect the economy. There was no problem there. Uh, and as far as the average person is concerned, when the crash came, he might have said to himself, it's a good thing that happened. These people deserve what I got. They're a bunch of gamblers. The reputation of stockbrokers sunk even lower during the 1700s. In Paris, an escaped murderer sold stock. John Law swindled the public with worthless shares in fictitious gold mines. In London, brokers lured investors with stories of a secret device that could turn chickens into sheep. The value of these stocks would skyrocket until reason took hold. Nothing is being done, but the shares are becoming more and more valuable as time goes on. Eventually, one person says, how can these shares possibly be worth 5,000 pounds? It's ridiculous. And he starts selling. And another person sells, and it goes to 4,000 pounds. And now a panic sets in, and the whole thing falls apart. Despite the unscrupulous brokers, stocks helped make Europe the colonial and economic powerhouse of the world. They would soon do the same for America.
Wall Street got its name when New York was a tiny colonial outpost. In 1653, pilgrims built a wall to keep out Indians. 100 years later, the wall was gone. But the path that ran beside it had become the heart of New York's commerce and society. Here was the auction block for slaves and the pillory for public humiliation. George Washington was sworn in as the first U.S. president on Wall Street in 1789. Wall Street was also where merchants gathered beneath a buttonwood tree to auction off stock in banks and mines, making a commission on every sale. This open-air market lasted until 1792, when 24 merchants signed a document known as the Buttonwood Agreement. The pact was an effort to avoid government regulation of street auctions. It also blocked newcomers from the business. And a group of the auctioneers, the most powerful ones, say, you know, this is anyone's coming into this market. We're losing business to these people. So let's form an organization called the New York Stock and Exchange Board in that tavern over there. And we'll have a door and we'll keep these people out. The brokers met inside the Tontine Coffee House for two formal auctions per day. The public was not allowed. If you wanted to buy or sell stock, you had to hire a broker to do it. What it did is it did one thing. It made the trading of stocks less public. So uh, the public had less information about what was going on. In the open auction system, where it was everybody could hear, uh, people knew more about what was going on. These indoor sessions where a central auctioneer sold stocks one by one allowed brokers to regulate themselves to prevent fraud and abuse. Only reputable stocks were traded and the sales were recorded. These procedures created an air of respectability. You change something from, you know, mere commerce of hawking the wares on the street, you, you sort of put it indoors and got a certain uh, a group of people who knew each other you're moving from a trade or a just ordinary business to a profession. During the auctions, prices were quoted in increments of one-eighth of a dollar, a holdover from the days when people carried Spanish mill dollars and cut them into pieces of eight. Only 30 companies were traded inside the exchange. Banks, cargo insurance companies, construction firms that build bridges and piers, but only a handful of fearless investors dared buy them. Many people were afraid of stock because if the company went bankrupt, the stock owners could lose everything. So stocks were for two kinds of people, outright speculators or people who try to take control of the company. The struggle for respectability on Wall Street brought only limited success. With time, the trading of less reputable stocks resumed on the street among brokers who weren't allowed to join the exchange. Here, disputes were settled with fists. Big changes, though, were in store for Wall Street. America's westward expansion would soon spark an explosion of activity. And technology would speed up the pace of business beyond anyone's wildest dream. Several legends describe how the terms bull and bear found their way to Wall Street. The most dramatic tale involves a style of bullfight in the old Wild West. A thousand pound grizzly would be chained to a stake in a bullfight arena. Then a bull would charge. The bull could win the contest by thrusting upward with its horns. The bear could survive by wrestling the bull down, breaking its neck. On Wall Street, bulls were brokers who expected stock prices to rise. Bears were traders who anticipated drops in the market. And many bears used the declines to outwit other investors. In those days, if you were on Wall Street, you had a dark side. Wall Street was no place for amateurs. Uh, there was no federal government on Wall Street. The state government didn't uh, have much to do. Uh, the rules are very few and far between. Um, in other words, it was a jungle. The bulls included colorful figures like Hetty Green, whose severe appearance and miserly character earned her the nickname the Witch of Wall Street. Green became the world's richest woman by investing in railroads.
America's railroads were among the most ambitious engineering projects in history. Railroad stocks fueled the frenzy on Wall Street. Up until the railroads, corporations were little small, little mom-pa shops. They didn't need a lot of capital. But when you're building a big railroad, you need to assemble a lot of money. And at that point, the stock market became very important. With shrewd rail investments, Hetty Green amassed a fortune of $100 million, the equivalent of nearly $2 billion today. Her advice to others was simple. There is no great secret to fortune making. All you have to do is buy cheap and sell dear. Act with thrift and shrewdness and be persistent. Hetty Green. To accommodate the railroad boom, the New York Stock Exchange moved several times in search of larger quarters. Settling in 1865 in a building near the corner of Wall and Broad. To create a pleasant atmosphere, the building's ventilation system wafted perfumed air across the crowded trading floor. To protect stock certificates, the basement housed hundreds of vaults. By 1870, the old system of auctioning stocks gave way to a free-for-all. Brokers roamed the floor, making deals throughout the day. In this crowd were ruthless marauders known as Wall Street Bears. The markets in those days, particularly the stock market, was an arena for the uh, gunslingers, uh, the takeover artists, the robber barons. Uh, this was their playground, and that's where they uh, ran prices of stocks up and down to suit whatever shenanigans they were trying to pull at the time. The most notorious bear was a former store clerk who became the market's most detested raider. Jay Gould was one of the most famous speculators in Wall Street. He was called the Mephistopheles, you know, sort of the devil of Wall Street, because uh, he was uh, always looking out for number one and, and not really uh, thinking so much about companies. That's what people say. I think he was also uh, interested in building up the value of some companies. But he was a manipulator. Gould earned his seat among the kings of Wall Street by mastering the short sale, a technique to make money when a stock went down in price. Gould would persuade unwitting investors to loan him their shares at a small rate of interest. He would immediately sell them at the exchange. Gould then published vicious rumors about the company in a newspaper he owned in order to drive its stock price down. He bought the shares back at the lower price and returned them to their owner. His profit was the difference between the price he received when selling and the price he later paid to buy the stock back. The fact that a company and its shareholders might be ruined in the process seemed of no concern to Gould. The bulls and bears made Wall Street a rambunctious place. The street itself remained a busy marketplace for the so-called curbstone brokers who continued to trade the stocks of smaller companies out of doors until they formed the American Stock Exchange in the 1920s. The bull and bear struggle also made Wall Street dangerous. Every 20 years, the street would fill with investors panicked over a crash in prices. Sometimes the exchange was forced to close for days. The outbreak of World War I sparked a panic that closed the market for more than four months. In 1832, a simple device revolutionized the stock exchange. The telegraph allowed news from distant cities to flash across the United States. In the world of finance where information is power, the telegraph was a godsend. The telegraph's inventor, Samuel Morse, opened a demonstration office near the stock exchange, charging brokers 25 cents to see his invention. Soon after, Wall Street was a tangle of telegraph wires. The telegraph turned New York into America's financial capital by eliminating the need for regional markets in other cities. The telegraph makes it possible for New York to become a central marketplace. At one time, we had uh, dozens of stock exchanges all over the country. There was a stock exchange in Albany, there was a stock exchange in Buffalo. But once the, te the telegraph goes to Albany and Buffalo from New York, they disappear. 
The stock ticker was the next innovation. Created in 1867, the ticker printed telegraph signals onto a narrow paper tape. The ticker brought up to the minute prices to brokers throughout the nation. For the first time, people outside the exchange could tell what was going on. July 8, 1889, another milestone. Issue number one of the Wall Street Journal, the price two cents. Charles Dow and Edward Jones raised the standard of financial journalism with their new publication. The most popular feature was the daily index of 12 stocks, known as the Dow Jones Industrial Average. By analyzing the performance of key companies such as American Sugar, U.S. Rubber, and General Electric, the Dow became a stock market barometer. It made sense out of what was perceived as chaos. In the daily jumble of up an eighth and down a quarter, it was hard to tell whether stock prices generally were moving up or down. With the industrial average, you could keep your eye on the long-term trends and not be confused by the short-term static. The ticker, the telegraph, and the Wall Street Journal were powerful tools that opened the world of stocks to the general public. The most powerful man in America was the son of a prominent banker who made his own mark in history as the undisputed king of corporate mergers. His name, J.P. Morgan. Morgan combined hundreds of independent railroads and factories into coast-to-coast -coast monopolies. Morgan's greatest achievement came in 1901, when nine companies joined forces to become U.S. Steel. It was the world's first billion-dollar corporation, with stocks so valuable it boosted the Dow Jones average by 500 percent. J.P. Morgan was a stern, autocratic man who never gambled and based his decisions on business fundamentals. To protect his customers, Morgan insisted on a role in managing every company he created. If he sold you a security, a stock in a railroad company, if the railroad company got into trouble, he would move in and try to improve the situation. He wouldn't say, well, you know, that's uh, tough. Uh, you bought the stock and you know what the risks were. I'm done with it. No, he wouldn't. He would say, I sold you that security and I thought it was good. It turns out it's not so good now. So I'm going to get involved in that railroad and I'm going to try to make it good. Morgan controlled 341 seats on the boards of more than a hundred different companies. Investors respected Morgan, but the public did not. His railroad monopoly raised shipping prices, hurting farmers. Morgan supported child labor and opposed labor unions. President Teddy Roosevelt used antitrust regulations to bust up parts of Morgan's empire. But when Morgan died in 1913, he received a funeral befitting royalty. The stock exchange closed for two hours as his hearse passed by. His death was treated like the death of a monarch. In other words, big funeral procession, front page news all over the world, editorials, one editorial saying he was a monster, thank God he's dead, another editorial saying the great age has passed and we have to find someone like him around. The only trouble was there was no one like Morgan. Uh, he was uh, sui generis, he was just by himself. Some hated Morgan so deeply that his company became the target of a terrorist bomb seven years after his death. On September 20th, 1920, a wagon loaded with explosives killed 30 people and injured 100. The entrances to the Morgan Company and the New York Stock Exchange across the street were littered with bodies. The crime was never solved. Wall Street quickly recovered from the 1920 blast. But more shocks were ahead. The biggest boom market in history was coming. So was the biggest crash. America had never seen anything like the 1920s. World War I ended in victory. Factories were booming. Families had money to burn. They go to the movies. They had a phonograph. The family might have had a car. All things were changing in that and getting better and getting much better. By 1920, the New York Stock Exchange, a private institution, looked more impressive than many government agencies. 
The exchange had torn down its building at the turn of the century to construct a larger one that projected an image of strength. The new trading floor was enormous. Each stock was now traded at a particular spot called a post. Steel stocks were clustered at one post, railroads at another. Auctioneers called specialists controlled the bidding. When a sale was made, clerks would rush details of the transaction by pneumatic tube to the ticker tape room, where typists would relay the news to the world. In the 1920s, the exchange was a place of glamour and wonder. I started out the floor of the New York Stock Exchange as a page in 1926, having just graduated from prep school, and I was 16 years old at that time. It was a very exuberant period. I thought it was kind of lively and a lot of fun. Stocks were becoming a national pastime. Americans bought millions of radios and shares in the company that made them. As cars became popular, so did auto stocks. The demand for stocks pushed prices through the roof. Between 1924 and 1929, the Dow Jones Industrial Average shot up more than 300%. You had a lot of people in the market that knew nothing about the market except they were going to make some quick money. And the thing was obviously overblown. Unscrupulous brokers made things worse by pressuring investors into buying questionable stocks. There was a lot of opportunity for people to believe in what they were being told, and there were a lot of people there willing to take advantage of telling them that this company or that stock or something was going to just really go gangbusters. Even more dangerous, many investors bought stock on credit, known in the trade as buying on margin. You could buy stock if you were a good customer for 10% margin. So if you wanted to buy a share of $100 stock, you could put up $10, and the stock itself became collateral for a loan for the other $90. The widespread use of credit and the tremendous rise in stock prices made some investors wonder how long the good times could last. In 1928, stockbroker Charles Merrill of the firm Merrill Lynch sent a bluntly worded warning to clients. Now is a good time to get out of debt we do not urge that you sell securities indiscriminately, but we do advise, in no uncertain terms, that you take advantage of present high prices and put your own financial house in order. Charles E. Merrill. Disaster struck Wall Street in October of 1929. Consumer spending on big-ticket items hit a slump causing several key stocks to decline. The drop sparked a rash of margin calls, where brokers demanded that investors put more cash into their stock market accounts. This was the risk of buying stock on credit. When a stock shrinks in price, it's no longer valuable enough to be collateral for the loan. Investors must put up cash or margin to even the scales. If they don't, their account will be liquidated. October 24th, 1929. Thousands of investors failed to come up with the necessary cash by the time their brokers entered the exchange. When the opening bell rang at 10 a.m., the liquidation sale began. Well, it started off, as I recall, like a busy day, and pretty soon it got worse and worse. Suddenly, uh, it appeared that everyone wanted to sell and no one wanted to buy, and, and uh, uh, there was a sense of frenzy. The credit binge that had built up the market was suddenly eating through it, like a virus. The imbalance between sellers and buyers pushed all stock prices lower, forcing margin calls on other investors and more liquidation. So many shares were sold so quickly that the ticker was running four hours late. Thousands of investors flooded the financial district, desperate for news. And suddenly, there was hope. Richard Whitney, vice president of the exchange, met with the nation's top bankers and marched onto the trading floor. And he walks up to U.S. Steel and says, what's steel at? And he says, 200. I'll buy 10,000 shares of steel at 200. And a roar goes up. The big guys are coming in. They're saving us. 
Whitney bought $20 million worth of stock in a matter of minutes. It was a powerful symbol. Recovery, resistance, hope. <laughs> I, I don't forget these people are, are, are seeing a whole place fall to pieces. And here's a guy who steps up and starts showing courage. It turned out Richard Whitney was not trying to save the market, but to fool it so the banks could eventually sell out at a better price. His triumphant stand stopped the panic temporarily, but the downward spiral resumed the following week with a bigger crash and continued for the next three years. The drop was staggering. General Electric went from more than $1,600 per share to $154. General Motors, $1,075 to $40. The Dow Jones Industrial Average fell 89%. $72 billion in investments wiped out. And people who had their whole life savings tied up in Wall Street vanished. It's out. No more. Zero. A person went from $500 to $15,000 and now he's down to zero. Economists contend the crash alone didn't cause the Great Depression that followed. But the public blamed Wall Street. The panic frightened people, and as they stopped spending money, the economy ground to a halt. The crash revealed major flaws in America's unregulated market price for stocks. Now with the nation in ruins, the federal government was about to impose radical changes in the way the exchange did business. This great nation will endure Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in 1932 as a reformer. In his very first speech in office, he took aim at the stock market. There must be a strict supervision of all banking and credits and investments. There must be an end to speculation with other people's money. On his second day in office, the president ordered the New York Stock Exchange to close for a week. He then pushed through Congress the most sweeping set of financial reforms ever enacted. Banks could no longer gamble on stocks. Brokers must act responsibly, treating their customers' money as if it were their own. And corporations that offered stock to the public must file annual financial reports with the government. The amount of information people had went up a great deal, and I think eventually that got institutions and individual investors saying, well, we want to buy stocks now because the, the deck isn't stacked against us, you know. We, we really have a lot better information than we used to, and so now Wall Street isn't the, uh, the den of thieves that we used to think it was. It's more of an honest place. This bill is stocked. Richard Whitney, now president of the exchange, spoke against the new regulation, saying the market could police itself. But nothing could stop the president's push for government oversight. Roosevelt created the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, to enforce the new rules. Its first chairman was Joseph Kennedy. The SEC would indict more than 300 people in an effort to clean up Wall Street although the agency found it virtually impossible to win convictions. The only major figure to go to jail was Richard Whitney himself, convicted of embezzlement. The man who led the market through its deepest crisis spent three years in Sing Sing before being released. The newly reformed market was a sleepy place in the 1930s and 40s as a weary public stayed away. Thousands of Wall Street workers lost faith in the paper chase and quit. You really didn't believe in paper anymore. You wanted to go out and earn your living doing something a lot more concrete. During World War II, the federal government, not the stock market, generated most of the money needed to reinvigorate American industry. The market generated less than 20%. The war did bring a historic milestone to Wall Street. Women who had worked in the back rooms now appeared on the stock exchange floor, ending a male-only tradition that had lasted 150 years. With victory came the market's most unique wartime contribution, the mountain of ticker tape confetti that welcomed America's troops home. The baby boom years after World War II sparked another major expansion of the American economy. 
But unlike the 1920s, this boom was fueled by solid investing instead of speculation. Leading the charge was Charles E. Merrow, who opened hundreds of new Merrill Lynch offices in the suburbs. The whole atmosphere changes. The brokerage house in the past was either for the sleazy characters or the bigwigs. Now it's middle class Americans. And Merrill says the person we're after is the GI, the ex-GI, with a wife and three kids and a Chevy. And that person should own shares. Own your share of America. And it works. Merrill Lynch offered investment classes for women and placed a How to Invest exhibit in New York's Grand Central Station. Commuters could drop in to see if stocks were right for them. One of their innovations was to make research reports, which they gave out free to uh, clients and would-be clients, saying, here, you know, here's our, what our company thinks, it's investigated this company, and here's how we see its prospects. As American investors returned to stocks, the market finally recovered. 90, brother. 90 How's it quoted? 90 to a quarter. 300 and 100. 90 quarter. In 1954, the Dow Jones Industrial Average broke 300. The market had set 25 years earlier, just before the 1929 crash. One of the biggest innovations in the 50s came not from Wall Street, but from a university campus 800 miles away. Economist Harry Markowitz of the University of Chicago developed the theory of stock diversification. Investors, he said, should buy a wide range of stocks to reduce the risk of bankruptcy when a single stock goes bad. What Marcus was saying is put your money into lots of different things and on average you're going to do pretty well. Even though you're never going to be at the top, you're never going to be at the bottom. The concept of a diversified stock portfolio is a basic tenant of modern investment. But for the 50s, the idea was so radical that it eventually earned Harry Markowitz the Nobel Prize for Economics. In the decades that followed, there were downturns in the market. In the 1960s, there were major slumps prompted by bad news during the Kennedy years and setbacks in the Vietnam War. The OPEC oil embargo hurt stock prices in the 1970s as Americans waited in line for a gallon of gas. But the most dramatic event since the 29 crash was coming soon. The introduction of the computer. A different kind of panic hit Wall Street in the 1960s. A paper panic. The rise of pension plans and mutual funds pushed the trading volume to 11 million shares per day. Every transaction was still processed by hand. So you have piles and piles of these uh, papers on desks, and you had a, a lot of these clerks just moving these papers back and forth. It's not surprising that when you had a lot of volume, you had a crisis. For brokerage companies, the paper crunch was terrifying. Exhausted clerks were unable to balance the books each night. The New York Stock Exchange had to close on Wednesdays to give clerks a chance to catch up. The clerks would work around the clock and every once in a while they go on a cot and sleep for an hour and come right back again. They wouldn't go home for weeks. At its height in 1968, the paper crunch touched off a devastating cash flow crisis, which forced nearly a hundred brokerage companies into bankruptcy. Computers solved the problem with their ability to document stock transactions at the speed of light. Since the 1970s, computers have assisted brokers with every aspect of the securities business. They route smaller transactions directly to the trading posts, ending the delay caused by hand carrying an order across the floor. Computers have vastly improved the market's ability to handle the ever-growing volume of trades. Computers, though, have had a dark side. They were largely responsible for the biggest single-day drop in stock market history. October 19, 1987 the market began a decline that raced out of control. Lightning fast computers had been pre-programmed to rapidly sell stocks when prices hit a predetermined level. Just press the button and you sold, which set off something at another computer, and a third computer, and a fourth computer. Now what happened was the volume was tremendous. People couldn't keep up with these things. 
The Dow Jones average plunged 508 points, a drop of 23%. The plummet taught traders a lesson. The New York Stock Exchange has installed circuit breaker programs that restrict trading when the Dow fluctuates too rapidly to prevent runaway disasters in the future. This computer in Connecticut has brought the marketplace for stocks to an historic crossroads. This is NASDAQ, built in 1971 by the National Association of Securities Dealers. The NASDAQ system is a quick and inexpensive way to trade without the need for face-to-face -face encounters. NASDAQ links hundreds of brokerage houses worldwide. What we're doing is we're replacing the people on the floor, congregating in a group, okay, to various people in different houses on the street at their desks, bidding and offering in this box. And everyone has access to what is going on at the same time. The NASDAQ Wall Street. It's fueled some of the greatest economic expansions ever known. It's plunged millions into poverty and ruin. Now the thrill, the terror, the technique, and the technology of the Stock Exchange on Modern Marvels. Every business day, more than a billion shares change hands on America's major stock exchanges. Nearly $90 million worth of stock changes hands every minute. Brokers constantly scramble to do their clients' bidding in the battlefield of high finance. The floor is a rather unique kind of place. It, uh, it's a place where people have known each other many years. Each day, get together to compete on behalf of clients they've never met. A stock exchange is actually two markets in one. First, it's a place where a new company can raise millions or billions of dollars overnight by offering ownership of the business to hundreds of thousands of small investors. These pieces of ownership are called shares of stock. Second, the exchange is the place where people can sell their stock to someone else whenever they wish. You could be in the airline business today, and you could be out of that, and you could be in the automobile business tomorrow. And that ability to enter and exit and get paid back for your investment in those shares creates a great market for the initial investment. People are more willing to put that money up if they know that sometime in the future they'll be able to sell out their interest and go on to the next best thing. 40% of American families own stock in U.S. companies either directly or through mutual funds and pension plans. The exchange lets people know how these companies are doing by allowing a free market to place a value on their stock. Well, I like to say that a stock market is a, a market in information. I mean, it uses information from outside to evaluate companies, but then the process of the stock market creates new information by putting a price on things that everybody in the country can read. The modern market is a tightly regulated and finely tuned institution. But this wasn't always the case. Centuries ago, investing in stocks was chaos. of investment trace back to ancient Greece. Ship captains offered part of their profits to those who'd share the risk of financing a trading voyage. These were all or nothing gambles. A ship might return with riches or might never return at all. The Romans sold stock as well for huge construction projects that were beyond the means of a single businessman. Stockholders made tidy profits by investing in companies that built roads and aqueducts for the government. Investing took a big step in the 1600s in Holland, home of the Dutch East India Company. Like the Greek seafarers before them, the Dutch needed capital for international trade. But this investment was different. People bought a stake in the company, not in a single voyage. This led to wild speculation because investors could sell their shares to one another over time. The price could rise or fall on the vaguest of rumors, spreading panic in the world's first stock exchange. The people who lost the money were the nobles, 
the merchants, uh, a, a class of people who, uh, in effect, were the money people of the time who can afford to speculate. It didn't affect the economy. There was no problem there. Uh, and as far as the average person is concerned, when the crash came, he might have said to himself, it's a good thing it happened. These people deserve what I got. They're a bunch of gamblers. The reputation of stockbrokers sunk even lower during the 1700s. In Paris, an escaped murderer sold stock. John Law swindled the public with worthless shares in fictitious gold mines. In London, brokers lured investors with stories of a secret device that could turn chickens into sheep. The value of these stocks would skyrocket until reason took hold. Nothing is being done, but the shares are becoming more and more valuable as time goes on. Eventually, one person says, how can these shares possibly be worth 5,000 pounds? It's ridiculous. And he starts selling. And then another person sells, and it goes to 4,000 pounds. And now a panic sets in, and the whole thing falls apart. Despite the unscrupulous brokers, stocks helped make Europe the colonial and economic powerhouse of the world. They would soon do the same for America. Wall Street got its name when New York was a tiny colonial outpost. In 1653, pilgrims built a wall to keep out Indians. One hundred years later, the wall was gone. But the path that ran beside it had become the heart of New York's commerce and society. Here was the auction block for slaves and the pillory for public humiliation. George Washington was sworn in as the first U.S. president on Wall Street in 1789. Wall Street was also where merchants gathered beneath a buttonwood tree to auction off stock in banks and mines, making a commission on every sale. This open-air market lasted until 1792, when 24 merchants signed a document known as the Buttonwood Agreement. The pact was an effort to avoid government regulation of street auctions. It also blocked newcomers from the business. And a group of the auctioneers, the most powerful ones, say, you know, this is anyone's coming into this market. We're losing business to these people. So let's form an organization called the New York Stock and Exchange Board in that tavern over there. And we'll have a door, and we'll keep these people out. The brokers met inside the Tontine Coffee House for two formal auctions per day. The public was not allowed. If you wanted to buy or sell stock, you had to hire a broker to do it. What it did is it did one thing. It made the trading of stocks less public. So uh, the public had less information about what was going on. In the open auction system, where it was everybody could hear, uh, people knew more about what was going on. These indoor sessions where a central auctioneer sold stocks one by one allowed brokers to regulate themselves to prevent fraud and abuse. Only reputable stocks were traded and the sales were recorded. These procedures created an air of respectability. You change something from, you know, mere commerce of hawking 